thank you so much for coming. Have you noticed how beautiful it is outside on a Friday afternoon? <laughs> so I know each of you made a choice to be here today instead of being at Shoreline Beach Cafe having a beer on the sand. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I am delighted uh, to see everybody here today once again on a Friday afternoon, which is when we usually have our Scheinfeld Center events. Um, I want to mention a couple of things before we get started. So for those of you unfamiliar with the Scheinfeld Center, I'm here to let you know that we now have a national award-winning entrepreneurship center here on campus. Last October, the Nas National Association for Community College Entrepreneurship awarded us with a National Impact Award for an entrepreneurship center having a significant impact in our community. We offer a degree program in entrepreneurship and many other exciting activities and programs such as this one today. But there are a couple of um, activities I like to emphasize. One is our new enterprise launch workshop. Last semester, we offered this for the first time where 50 students volunteered their time in our student club and launched products and services in a single semester. And we, uh, we had 10 products and showcased them on demo day in front of investors and gave away $1,000. This was so popular, we're doing it again this semester and orientation is February 10th and there's information outside about our uh, enterprise launch program um, this semester. In addition, we will be conducting our second annual New Venture Challenge, which is a campus-wide business plan competition. And we are once again, uh, again giving away over $15,000 in awards for this year's competition. I want you to consider for a moment President Obama's recent State of the Union address. He pointed out that in the last 22 months, businesses have created more than 3 million jobs. That's the most jobs created since 2005. He also reminded us that most new jobs are created in startups and small businesses. He emphasized that an economy built to last is one where we encourage the talent and ingenuity of every person in this country. That means we need to support everyone who's willing to work and every risk taker and entrepreneur who aspires to become the next Steve Jobs. I believe we are giving our students this support right here at the Scheinfeld Center and I continue to believe with all my might that there is no more relevant place to be on campus. I want to point out that last year the Scheinfeld Center became host to the Small Business <laughs> Development Center. And so we are providing a community service to small business owners and students that have businesses or want to start up, providing one-on-one -on -one counseling and coaching to small business for the sole purposes of helping businesses start up, create more jobs, increase sales, and get financing. This is a no-cost service to students in small business. We exceeded our goals as a center and provided counseling to over 125 businesses in Santa Barbara County and over 450 hours of counseling. So please support the SBDC today by filling out the student uh, surveys or the participatory surveys that you were handed as you came in the door. So if you could fill those out before you leave and um, pop them in the boxes outside, that would be uh, appreciated. Our event partner this evening is the new SBCC Alumni and Friends Association. They are working to create a thriving community of alumni, students, faculty, friends, and parents that are united in the common association as SBCC advocates. And they intend to create a community that embodies the spirit of SBCC and comprises so many people like Jason Womack, who emphatically share the sentiment that they would not be where they are today without Santa Barbara City College. Did I hear a clap? I want to uh, introduce a very vibrant, outgoing, personable, talented, incredibly smart, and an overall likable guy. Jason and I had a very hard time getting together these last few months as both our schedules were jammed with travel and work. We discovered we would both be in New York City at the same time, so we set a meeting there. <laughs> I find it absolutely crazy that the only way I could meet Jason was to be in New York City at the same time he was, but it really did work out that way. So here we are, this past Monday, having dinner at one of his favorite restaurants on 50th and Broadway. <laughs> it's an honor to have Jason Womack here with us today. Jason, an international consultant to Fortune 100 companies, is an expert in how we can make ourselves better performers, and he has a keen ability to ask 
pointed questions to get you thinking about your own goals. And I'm still contemplating some of the questions he asked me about myself over our dinner. <laughs> His insight as to how we can better our lives in general and our work lives in particular is so relevant in today's fast-paced, crazy world. Jason's work and his book offers guru-like advice for helping us find that ever-elusive focus and balance in our lives, and I think we're in for a treat this afternoon. Please, let's give a warm welcome to Jason Womack. Good afternoon, everybody. Big smile, big smile. Uh, delighted to be back on campus. Uh, first got to Santa Barbara City College in 1990, uh, straight out of high school, one of those stores. Who came straight to City out of high school? This was the next stop for you. So welcome. Uh, so many amazing things are going to happen here. Uh, what I thought I would do is give you a little bit about Am I okay, Gary? I'll keep on talking. Um, give you a little bit of background, as most people on this side of the stage would do. The real focus that I'd like to get to is, everyone check your clocks, your watches, your phones. By about 5.10, I would love to start up a Q&A, some kind of a dialogue back and forth. So for those of you wondering about these different kinds of things, we'll talk about entrepreneurship, small businesses, and those kinds of things. Just kind of get those questions going. Um, I noticed that I pressed the button for my laptop to show up, but it didn't, so I'm going to go back there. Just one second. I'll be right back for everybody. That's the one I wanted. Uh, so I always uh, make myself as available as I can. That is my cell phone number, so when, if you have a question, you can text me. That's my Twitter handle, so if you have something that you want to share, that's good. Okay, it's late in the afternoon. We'll, go, we'll work together on this one. Uh, please go ahead and do that. Um, I actually give, this is my first slide wherever I'm speaking in the world. So in the past year, I got to visit uh, several different countries, 142 airplane flights, 260 nights in hotels to get my body around the world to do what it does. What do I get to do? Um, I get to st speak with small businesses, entrepreneurs, people just starting up, managers who've just been promoted all the way up to Fortune 100 CEOs. Uh, the last company I had to work with, the last biggest company I had to work with was an aerospace company out in Washington, D.C., and the executive that I was advising for two hours, which was a long time for him, uh, his former job was he advised Clinton every morning on the state of the Middle East. So he had an insight into the world that I just could not grasp. Uh, I guess one of the first things that I want to share with you about entrepreneurship, who's at least interested in entrepreneurship? I'm just trying to get everybody to raise their hand. Um, this is working. Uh, probably the first thing that I want to share with you about entrepreneurship is it's actually easy. Identify a problem, figure out a solution that people will pay you for, and make that solution as available as possible to the world. Not simple, but easy. And if you take a look at what you're carrying with you right now, what you're wearing, what you're holding, what you have in your pocket, your purses, your wallets, your backpacks, at some point, that was a problem that someone had to solve. Each month, I pick a biography to study. So this uh, last month was Thomas Edison. Uh, when he was a kid, they called him Al. And uh, the story, one of the stories about Al is he was in the farm barn one morning. His parents were looking all over the place. And one of his uncles says, I think I know where he is. Well, the story goes that the day before, Al had seen a chicken, a hen, sitting on an egg. And someone told him, oh, if the hen sits on the egg, it will hatch into a chick. So he was in the barn, sitting on an egg. <laughs> uh, by the way, Thomas Edison went on to uh, hold over 1,000 pat 1,092 patents for the problems he solved. Uh, around the county, I get to work with the Ventura Ventures Technology Center, the V2TC. Anybody involved in the V2TC? Who's heard of the V2TC? Okay, if you have not heard about this, if you're an entrepreneur, I'd write this down. V2TC.com. The Ventura Ventures Technology Center down in... All right, we're with me. Um, what they did is they actually found a, a place, City Hall, right off of Main Street. And they've got over 40 offices. Right now, we have about 22 offices that are vacant, looking for someone who needs office space. 
We have uh, in residence, we have three entrepreneurs in residence. We have a finance guy, we have a technology guy, and we have a psychology guy. That's me. <laughs> so what we can do is support organizations who are just starting up. We've got a couple companies that have just launched in the past year, one, two, three people, and then just at the end of last year, we did get one company funded at 2.4 mil. Right? I, I'll take that clap. Um, I, <laughs> I love working with all sizes and groups and, 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 and industries, but I got to tell you, working with a company that was just funded, it's a little bit different. Um, around the world, I get to talk about this thing called Your Best Just Got Better, and I'm going to delve into a little bit about what that means to me. But what I'd first like to do is talk about what we saw as the myth of time management. The myth. And where I get to spend most of my time, where I get to spend most of my focus is on the psychology of productivity. By the way, who's taking a psych class? Okay, who looked in the mirror this morning? That was a psych class. <laughs> Whoa, who are you? <laughs> Just trying to figure this out. My second master's degree came in, in psychology because after I'd gotten my first master's in education, I knew how to teach. I taught for four years up in Ojai, California at high school. I did a little bit of work at Ventura College. Um, I had to go back to school. I knew how to teach, but I wanted to know why people wouldn't learn. Uh, quick show of hands. How many of you know someone who knows better? <laughs> Those of you who laugh, you know what that meant. <laughs> right? They know what they should be doing, but they're not doing what they know they need. There seems to be a delta. A great book out there written called The Knowing-Doing Gap. I know what to do. I'm not doing what I know I need. So for a couple years, I went and I studied psychology, specifically studying the voice inside our minds that changes our minds. The voice inside our minds that changes our minds. On the way to school, on the way to work, on the way to the office, have you ever made a mental to-do list? Today I'm gonna, today I'm gonna, today I'm gonna. Then you get to school, you get to the office, you get to the whatever, and you get beat up by the world, and then you're leaving, you're going back home, and you think, I forgot to, I forgot to, I forgot to, I forgot to. It seems like there's this delta between all those ideas that I had and all those ideas that did not get done. Who's ever emailed themselves out in the world, back into the office? <laughs> now, some of us in the room, we're old enough to remember. How many of you remember calling your own voicemail? Oh, yeah. Right, they're all going, you did what? <laughs> Let me just tell you, there was a time before email, imagine that, where we were at home and we had an idea about work the next day. So what did we do? We picked up the phone, we called our own voicemail, dumped a message in there, had dinner, went to sleep, got in the car, drove to work the next morning, got into the office, see the blinking light, and you think, oh, somebody called. <laughs> <laughs> the psychology of productivity is the study of the self in an engaged environment. The next thing that I study, my next profession, is then sociology. I have an idea, you have an idea, we need to meet with ideas. Right. Who's ever had the feeling they miscommunicated with somebody? Right. Who's ever been in a miscommunication, realizing you're miscommunicating, but you still can't get out? <laughs> uh, any guys in the room ever been in a miscommunication, knew you were wrong, <laughs> and couldn't get out? <laughs> it's like, dang, I know I'm wrong, but I can't admit I'm wrong. I'm... I've found that people approach the world in one of two ways. I have a whole group of people that approach the world from a noun orientation. Who opens up their email, closes the email, marks the email unread? I'll come back to you later. Okay, that's the indicator that I need to do something about that. Who makes a to-do list? Who's ever rewritten that to-do list? My rewriters of to-do list tend to be noun-oriented productivity focusers. You write down a person's name, you write down an event, you write down a situation, you write down some circumstance. Right? How many of you open up an email, you know you have to take an action on that email, that email is out of the inbox and there's a to-do written down somewhere, there's a note on your calendar, there's something added to the to-do list. Got to be a couple of you. My verb-oriented. By the way, when I would get to work with someone, one of the first things I do is I say, glance through your old notebook. Uh, how many of you attend meetings or classes and you write notes down while you're... Uh, does anybody write in the margin of those notes? Anybody write in the margin? What goes in the margin? Somebody help me out. What goes in the margin? To-dos. Those, those of you who make to-dos in the margin, how do you mark the to-dos? Arrow, star, a little box, <laughs> usually initials. I know people who travel with a highlighter and they'll highlight the to-do. 
Now, by the way, I hope what you're getting away from this one right here is my psychological, my psychographic approach to productivity may be different than my colleague. My colleague may be a verb-oriented action list maker. I may be a noun-oriented visionary. Uh, by the way, let me see if I can give this to you an example. Uh, let's say I'm in the office, I'm on the, uh, at working at my desk, the phone rings, ring, ring, I answer hello, and someone says, hi, is this Jason? Yes, it is. Jason, will you tell us about your coaching program? Okay, you got that? Two hours later, phone rings, ring, ring, hello. Is this Jason? Yes, it is. Jason, what do you do during your coaching program? Raise your hand if you just had an aha. I got two. I'll get you. I'll get you. I'll get you. I got, I got about 40 more minutes. <laughs> but y'all understand that if someone says, Jason, tell me about your coaching program, the last thing they want to hear is, well, I fly in the night before. We usually meet for dinner. By 8 a.m. we're going to. By noon we will have. By the first day. They don't want to know the details. A noun-oriented approach wants to know the vision. They want to know the design. They want to know the, if you're from Canada, process. <laughs> Versus that client, that colleague, that vendor. Jason, what do you do during the coaching program? I have to be careful of painting too broad a picture. They want to know the actions, the tasks, what they're going to delegate and how to follow up. Just that one right there may, be, have, may have been worth coming to this class. Why? Because you might have a professor who's your opposite. Oh, by the way, here's how it sounds. I thought you meant versus I thought we should have. I love the, the verbal. The, Woohoo! Right. Now, by the way, I've been alluding to this the whole conversation so far. But then there's this third category. And by the way, a piece of paper and a pen, that's probably the most strong technology I've ever known. I have an idea, I can write it down, come back to you later. All right. The first social media platform that I was ever on, email. Email, status update, five of my friends, I'm going out this weekend, who wants to come? <laughs> and, and each next social media, who's on Pinterest? Okay, is this surprising you like it's surprising me? Where'd it come from? I did not see that coming. The technology that's connecting the sociology, the sociology, by the way, how the invisible affects the visible, will make me think different. Forty-five seconds. I'm going to ask you to turn to the person sitting next to you. Introduce yourself. Make that weird, you know, kind of, ooh, my name is, my name is. But I'm going to be 45 seconds. I need you to come up with what you think a myth of productivity is. 45 seconds. Are you ready? Set. Let me ask you to clap one time if you can hear me. Clap one time if you can hear me. Clap twice if you can hear me. Clap three times if you can hear me. So the myth of productivity. Right. What is that? And um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you came up. Oh, by the way, how many of you uh, met someone, introduced yourself? How many of you talked to someone that you'd never talked to in your life before? Okay, do more of that. Do more of that. Your work, your world, your life, everything about you will change in the next 60 months based on who you'll take a risk and introduce yourself to. The restaurants you eat in, the movies you see, the books you read, the conferences you go to will be the direct result of you extending your arm and saying, hi, my name's Jason. Now, for those of you who think this is a little stalkerish, I've been accused of that before. Jason, are you one of those guys who stands in line at Starbucks waiting for someone to make eye contact? 
Let me see if I can. Uh, I always leave breadcrumbs along the way that I usually try and pick up on the end. So I um, told you pretty early on, uh, entrepreneurship is pretty easy. All you have to do is find a problem. So let me just connect a couple of things here, right? If I find a problem that I don't know the solution to, and if my next 60 months are going to change based on who I spend my time with, then here's the question I hope you'll write down and practice for the rest of your life. Who do you know who? Who do you know who has fill in the blank? Who do you know who does fill in the blank? Who do you know who is? Fill in that blank. And you can use it over and over and over again. I'm using my social network. By the way, chapter five of my book, and I hope uh, my book comes out actually next Tuesday. Advanced copies are available tonight. And I hope you all get a, uh, a, you know, copies in triplicate for you and your friends. <laughs> At any rate, chapter five is called Improvement and Your Social Network. Not your social media network, your social network. Your social network started much, much, much before you ever entered Facebook. Your social, your social network, my social network, I can trace back to second grade. Mrs. Thorpe. I had just lost Connect Four. And I was crying. And she came over and said, Jason, it'll be okay. By the way, who's had a teacher, a coach, some person of influence affect you positively in your life? How many of you, their name just came to your mind? Are they alive? Write them a letter. Are they alive? Write them a letter. If they're not alive, write them a letter and then just burn it. That's another seminar. <laughs> Taught high school for five, for, for five years, one year in Santa Barbara and four years up in... Oh, hi. And the letters that come back from the students, oh, sh I forgot to say something. Uh, how many of you have had someone of influence and in, in kind of impact your life? A coach, a teacher, raise your hands again. A friend, a, a neighbor, a... You're that person for someone else. I don't care how young you are. If I can stand here and say, I've had someone influence me in a positive way, I need to be able to hold the mirror and smile in that thing. And go, wow, Jason. Maybe you were that person to somebody. I write one handwritten thank you card a day. Every day in my life, one handwritten thank you card. To who? Doesn't matter. Somebody. Seven a week. I get through about 40 a month. My wife is tracked. Jason, you need more stamps? I need more stamps. <laughs> by the way, who's ever received a thank you card in the mail? Who's ever received a thank you card in the mail? It's, it's something. Did you hold on to it, by the way? Save it for a rainy day? Some people save money for a rainy day. I have a bunch of thank you cards. Right. Because the investment that I can get in that. Now, my thinking was, if that's how I felt receiving a card, what would happen? How would I feel if I wrote one? Oh, I should probably come back to this one. Um, the myth of productivity is that you'll ever get it all done. Actually, if I had time, which I do, I would actually say there's a deeper myth, and that's the myth that you want to get it all done. <laughs> by default, and I hope you acknowledge this about yourselves, by default, the reason you're here is you want more to do. You're here. You all understand the people who didn't come tonight, they don't want any more to do. Friday afternoon, they're out. <laughs> right, some of you are out mentally, but you're here physically. You're here with me right now. And what I know about the people that I get to spend my life with, the people who inspire me the most, they are the ones willing to find an open block of time and see how to fill it. But here's the catch. We can fill it with busy or busyness. That's the other way of saying business. Who's ever had a day where they were really, really, really busy? Ever had a day where you were really busy? You get to the day, oh my gosh, I didn't have enough time today. I was really busy. Who's ever had one of these days? And then you think, what did I do? <laughs> the time went by. 
And so one of the things that I work on my clients with, and remember, we've got the psychology, sociology, product, uh, technology of a productive day, is I'm always working with my clients to create some kind of a dashboard, some kind of a place they can come back to that reminds them of what are the most important things, the MITs, I call those. By the way, who's ever had a class or a meeting get canceled? Who's ever had a class or a meeting? Last minute, had a class or a year, you get to the class, oh, man, it's been canceled, right? There are three things that happen when a meeting or a class get canceled. In this order, three things that happen. If I watched you, these three things happen. First one, you'd go, uh, meeting's canceled. <laughs> Who's ever put a fake meeting on their calendar? I'm looking at the front row. <laughs> <laughs> they put that meeting, meeting with Bob. Who's Bob? Uh, consultant. Oh, by the way, three things that happen. First thing that happens is you do a little mini celebration. Woohoo! The second thing that happens, you leave the meeting on the calendar. If the class gets canceled, you don't call people to tell them the class was canceled. And then the third thing that happens, and this is the worst possible thing that anybody can do when a class or a meeting gets canceled, the worst thing you can do is you ask this terrible, terrible, terrible question. You ask, what should I do now? I have an hour. I wonder what I should. And people will spend 58 minutes looking for something to do with that hour. And so whether you set your dashboard up, who are my Post-it users? Got to be a couple of folks in the room. Anybody using Post-its, writing things down on Post-its? Anybody have pieces of paper as reminders of things to do? Oh, there's a stack, there's a file, there's a pile. That's your dashboard. And so please don't get caught up in the technology behind me. The dashboard is literally where I look. When I'm driving my car, nay, when you're driving your car, most people that I know are really only interested in four things while they're driving. How fast are they going? How much gas do they have? What station is it on? And how loud is it? Everything else is kind of detailish. The RPM thing? I don't know. I don't know what that does. It goes up and then it comes back down and it stays in the middle. But if a song comes up, the volume goes on. Anybody ever listen to their stereo on scan? Just driving down scan, just see what's out there. <laughs> By the way, I think most people review their daily email like they review their scan on their stereo. That one. That one I'll dive into. Who's taking notes on tonight? Nouns or verbs? Interesting. Interesting. Am I writing down a thing, an idea, a title, a potential? Am I writing down an action, a delegation, a task? I had a mentor of mine, Jack Smith, my high school principal when I taught up in Ojai, and I, was, I had one of those composition books, you know those black and white marbled books, right? The 99 cents, I could afford those as a teacher. <laughs> And anyway, I'm sitting in a meeting with Jack, and we're sitting down, and I have my monthly meeting with my boss, and we're flipping through the pages because there were things that I'd written down over the past three and a half weeks that I wanted to tell him. And I'm flipping through the pages, flipping through the pages. He reaches across the table. He grabs the notebook from me, grabs it out of my hand. He goes to the front of the workbook. He says, Jason, from the front of the notebook to the back, write down your ideas. Then he goes to the very last page. He says, one item per line. Write down what you have to do. That was 1998, and that changed my life. I, get, I would bet that I've saved over 200 hours of my life not having to flip through pages to find out where the little initials or boxes or stars or arrows, what did I miss? Highlighting. Highlighting. Uh -huh. I always say to my clients, if you think it, ink it. I can come back to you later on. I did teach high school history in Spanish for a while. Uh, best job in my life, second best job, best job, I don't know. This, it was a great job. Um, I spent a long time though, and I was teaching kids how to memorize things. Nowadays, I'm asking my clients to forget more. And it sounds paradoxical, but I want you to have more ideas than you know what to do with while you're sitting here. Forget about this lecture until Monday morning. Pull open that piece of paper on Monday and go, okay. Okay, that reminds me. I want to follow up with that. I didn't really like that. I don't want to do anything about that. Ooh, let me text Jason about that question. I'm going to give it to you again. I'll give you my email. I'll give you, my, you know, just everything about my social security number. But you'll, you'll, you'll get it all. You'll get it all, okay? Uh, how many of you have access right now to a piece of paper? How many of you have access right now? If you don't have one, you need to borrow one from your friend. You've got three minutes. This is a long one. Between you and your partner, I want you to come up with, between the two of you, Five words 
that describe you as an entrepreneur? If they're the same, fine. If they're five words a piece, three minutes, I'll be back. Write them down, write them down, write them down. Five words that describe you as an entrepreneur. If you enjoyed that process, you could thank your partner or quickly turn away. <laughs> Either way, let them know you're done. So, a uh, quick show of hands. How many of you, and this is going to be kind of the first real deep question, so I hope we're getting along here. Um, but how many of you believe that the five words you chose may have at least a little bit been influenced by the first 30 or so minutes of my remarks? Anybody have any? Cool. Well, that sometimes happens, right? Uh, by the way, I've done this on both sides. I've done this at the start of presentations, write down five words that describe you as an entrepreneur, and I've done it midway through. So I don't know which is the right way. Tonight we did it midway through. Uh, I have not found, I haven't done enough strategy about it, behind it. Um, yeah. Shout out a couple. What was one word you came up with to describe you as an entrepreneur? You're gonna, you can take that one. That's not cheating. It's collaborating. <laughs> Give me one. Perfect. Persistence over here. A couple more. Connector. 3C. 3C. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Now, by the way, from the back... <coughs> That's right, that's right. From the back of the room, when I hear someone give me three C, and then every single one of those words add, a, ends in shun, I'm building a psychographic of how to communicate with that person. Action-oriented. Now, it's not that we're one or the other. It's like a car battery. You need plus and minus on both sides. If you take one of those off, the battery won't work. But we lean one side toward another. And if I know that as a, as a noun-oriented guy, if I can associate, sit down with, and work with someone who attacks things from a verb orientation, we can keep on going. Right. We go out to dinner, and we get to share, we get to break bread together and, and, and have a conversation. I will have developed a new website company. <laughs> I own over 140 domains. Jason, why do you have so many? Because I get an idea. That is, I found a, to a problem that I found. <laughs> Grew up in a restaurant. Spent the first seven, from, from seven to 14 in a restaurant. Right? When I look around and I see someone in a restaurant, I go, wow, there are things they could do to increase their net gain in tips. I'm not selling anything tonight, so I'm not going to give you the domain. But I built a website that teaches people how to earn more as a server in a restaurant. I put this up there. They can download all of that. That's theirs. Entrepreneurship's really quite easy. You find a problem. You serve up a solution that people will pay you for. Uh, the goal. The goal, right? Productivity. So a lot of what I get to do around the world is sit down with people. My main job is executive coaching, where I sit down and for two days, I observe my client. They go to a meeting, I go to the meeting. They answer the phone, I listen to the phone call. They get interrupted, I watch the interruption. They go to lunch, I go to lunch. They want to bring me home, there's an extra charge. <laughs> And I'm searching, I'm searching for the problems that they don't even know they have. And by the way, it usually sounds like a complaint. And if you really want to start a business quick, it sounds like this. Why doesn't, or I wish that, and whenever someone says, why doesn't it just, I wish that, I stand up and go, is there something there to serve up to people? 
There's something that I could provide that we could engage in a conversation. Uh, let me go through these really quick. I know um, <clears throat> I want to get some soon. Do you have some questions already? Just give me a nod or a nod. We can talk some more, and then I'll you know, build some questions. So we've got one coming. Four limited resources. Uh, again, this is where I get to spend my life. At the end of the day, a week, a year, or a career, when people look back and they say, oh, I didn't get to do everything I wanted to do. I didn't have enough. And that's the one that I want to get rid of. There are four things that come together that make for you having a more productive weekend this weekend. Now, some of you are going to say, but Jason, I don't want to work this weekend on that stuff, but you want to work on that stuff. Anyone ever heard someone say, I wish I just had time to do nothing? Have you heard someone say this? The next time they say that to them, just call them out. You're lying. You're, I wish I had time to do nothing. Lie. Why? Because if you had time to do nothing, you'd do something. You'd read a book, go for a walk with a dog, you'd watch a movie, take a nap, go outside. There are so many things you could do if you had time to do Oh, by the way, here's a quick little tip. Put off to the side of your to-do list, <clears throat> your post-it, if I had time to do nothing, AKA if a meeting gets canceled, here are four 15-minute things I could engage in. I'm gonna meditate for 15 minutes, I'm gonna read two chapters of a book for 30 minutes, I'm gonna call my mom for 15 minutes. Simply waiting until I have the time to do that. Right, when I was a kid, I was brought up to think that there were um, 24 hours in a day. Right? But that doesn't mean anything to me anymore. This one did. <coughs> in the past week, have you had anybody show up late to a meeting with you by 15 minutes? Has anyone had anybody show up late? Uh, they were responsible for 1% of your day. By math. If someone shows up 15 minutes late to a meeting with me, they just stole 1% of my day. That's, that's not okay with me. Oh, by the way, when someone runs late, the kicker of it is, 15 minutes before they arrived late, they knew they were gonna be late. And we live in a world now where you can let someone know. Hey, who are my morning people? Sun comes up, woohoo, it's another day, it's gonna be great. Who are my morning people? Mm -hmm. Who are my night people? Sun goes down, you kick into gear. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have no idea when you are. You just kind of <laughs> go through them. Uh, we found that your mental and physical energy change what you focus on. Morning people, I would suggest for the next week, try this. Don't check email for the first 15, 30 minutes of the morning. Mm -mm. Now, someone's wondering, but Jason, if I didn't check email for the first 15 to 30 minutes of the morning, what would I do? My answer, anything else. <laughs> Review that PDF, go through that file, call that one client, go to that one website, do that research, sleep in. Hey, who, who, how many of you set your alarm early just so you can hit snooze a few times? Right. Here's a five-day experiment. Stop that for five mornings. Just five. Give me a shot. Jason, when should I set my alarm? For the last possible moment you can wake up and not be late. I'm going to put this entire slideshow online. Would that be better? Right. You're welcome. Who has access to a digital camera? Yeah. If you have access to a digital camera, you've probably taken a picture where the autofocus ran for you. <laughs> autofocus fascinates me. Fascinates me. In the workplace, what if I had an autofocus tool at work? Actually, you know what's more fascinating to me? You know what I want to invent? And I need some help with this? I want a technology that acts as an auto blur. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. 11.45 on a Thursday, an email comes in that I do not need to do anything about till Friday afternoon. Wouldn't it be cool if that was just blurred? <laughs> We're close. We're close, by the way. Siri's on track for these kinds of things. But remember the whole thing I said about the next 60 months, the vacations you take, the restaurants you eat, and the books you read, and where you go will be affected by your social network? Not your social media network. Your friends, your colleagues, your professors. That's what I think about when I think of focus. And let me end with this slide, and then we're going to start with your question. Okay? She's looking at me. Good. This is interesting to me. How I design my ecosystem 
will affect those other three resources. How many have an office or a desk space? How many have a backpack? How many have a wallet or a purse that you think should be different and have something different and look different? I wish it would just. Come on, who has a house or apartment that talks to you? <laughs> you walk in, the floor goes, clean me, clean me. The wall says, fix me, fix me. Paint me, paint me. So if I could leave you with a couple of thoughts, we're going to break into some Q&A. If I could leave you with a couple of thoughts, uh, entrepreneurship is easy, not simple. I need to identify a problem that other people have already found that need for a solution and serve something up for them. I need to engage with people and meet them where they are. Oh, you're a visionary. Let me paint a picture of where we're going. Oh, you're an action-oriented person. Let me tell you what we could do. There's four limited resources that I have to manage in a day. And they don't go linearly, I don't think but how I use my time and where I put my energy and what I decide to focus on or blur is extremely relative to the environment or ecosystem that I'll spend my time in. So we're holding applause. We're going to go straight into Q&A, and I've got until 5, 5.30, correct? So you're going to run a mic for me? Yeah. Great. And then whoever's next, if you want to wrap around, maybe, or go to the end so we can get you a, a mic. Thank so you. quick, was on? Yes. Okay. Quick question is, you had on one of your slides, and you spoke about observing your CEOs for two days and seeing where their problems are, as well as seeing where they are most efficient and what's the biggest sucker of their time. If you could touch upon maybe some of the things that you see that are quick things besides not looking at our email for the first 15 minutes that you see people could be um, more efficient and use their time um, more wisely and have less distractions, that'd be great. The loudest one gets, oh yeah, I get it. <laughs> uh, interruptions. Far and away far and away. Um, USA Today did research whether you believe in USA Today and how much credibility you give that newspaper. It is the nation's largest newspaper. Uh, but they did a, a study. Most people sitting at a desk eight to ten hours a day. I'm looking at a couple people over here. <laughs> uh, sitting at a desk eight to ten hours a day are interrupted by their outside world 180 times per day. Now, I got something from a mentor of mine, Ken Blanchard. He wrote the book, The One Minute Manager. That's probably the, the one book I'll recommend tonight. I may get to another one, The One Minute Manager. He recommended a process that I call now three or more. And essentially, what I'm doing is I'm banking. So if I think of you and something to tell you, I'm going to hold on to that until I've built up a bank of three or more. Now, if you play this out, <clears throat> if I think of three or more things, and you think of three or more things, and I walk into your space and I say, hey, hey do you have a, oh, by the way, what do people always ask for? Do you have a, yeah, they never want a minute. They never want a minute. Actually, I should give you these quick two tips right away. Um, when you need something from someone, you're going to call them. Call them on the 53. I call you on 953, 253, 453. And when you answer the phone, I say, hey, it's 9.53. I have a 10 o'clock. Do you have a few minutes? What did I just tell the client? There's an end. There's an end. I'm going to get out now that I've gotten in. If the conversation goes, I have that out. Now, if I bank those three interruptions, and she, he banks those three interruptions, we sit down once, we talk about six things. Mathematically, managerially, it'll take less time to talk about six things at one time than one thing six times through the day. So by far and away, one of the first things I'm looking for is what is the interruption program at this office? Do people have full license to come in, or are they banking those interruptions? Um, probably the second one that I would take a look at. Who's ever gone into their sent items to find an email they sent to one person, copied it, and sent that same information on to somebody else? Yeah, I'd stop that right away. <laughs> I'd stop that right away. Um, in Outlook or Apple Mail, I would build a whole inventory of new signatures. 
See, I can guarantee you what kinds of questions I'll get based on the kinds of seminars I present. Right? I wrote a 38-page booklet on how to use Microsoft Outlook, just a little side project I did. But if someone were to email me, Jason, will you send me that Microsoft Outlook document? I'm not going to go to my sent items, copy, and send it. I'm going to swap the signature. That signature has a 400-word response with a link to a website to download for free the PDF of the Outlook. Does this make sense? It, it's, it's kind of a template. Uh, there's three out there, right? There's uh, BlackBerry, there's iPhone, and there's Droid. So let's just go, who's BlackBerry right now? Who's got a BlackBerry? And who's got a Droid? And who's got an iPhone? Who doesn't have anything? Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, just bear with me for this next example. All right? You know, all these systems, <clears throat> they try to fix the, t the spelling mistakes you make. And iPhone's the best, right? It's like, I did not type that. Anyway, um, you can decide what you want misspelled words to be. Who just had an aha? I got one up here. See, the next time someone emails you about something that you've already created a response for, I just make that a cute keyword, two or three letters. Those two, three letters become 400 word response. When I'm out in the field, Ryan, there's no way I'm gonna wait till I get back to my office to type someone an answer. Why? I've made them wait for four, five, six, 12 hours. And not only that, now I have to go work after dinner. I've got three word responses built into my iPhone that become three, four, five, seven hundred word emails. Those drop at least a couple of ideas into your, into your little garden. You pick up and then it becomes, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So on your, your two or three email, uh, are those a search that then created automatic response? So my YouTube channel? YouTube.com slash Jason Womack. I've got videos on how to build signatures, BlackBerry auto text, iPhone shortcuts. And then it'll show you, it'll show you out there. It's, you're close. Okay. Entrepreneurship, innovation, development. She's going to run you a mic. So if you'll stand up, let her know who, who, wh where to run to. Oh, I totally lied, brother. I'm going to get you before you leave. Yo. Hey. Um, you said you had something like 100 and something domains? Yes. Yeah, I was wondering how many of those are active? How many they, are of those? Uh, what's, your sort of, what's your profit from all those? And what's your, I guess, your salary? Or how much money did you make? <laughs> this is a great entrepreneurial point that I'd like to make. Um, and the entrepreneurial point is the fastest way to manage time better is to tell the truth more. You got to the question you wanted to ask, and I acknowledge you for that. Next time, go for the question. All right. um, by the way, for me, a profit on a website development is did I make enough money to pay for the experiment? Uh, my wife and I, over the past 18 years, we've started five companies together. We've got three that are still running. Two of those companies we knew we started and we were going to get out of. The first one we started to make enough money to go to Italy, and the second one we started to make enough money to get her out of a job she didn't want to be in. So I actually built the plan knowing that there was an exit. Uh, the Womack company that I've got right now, this is the one that I'm going to go, I'm going to keep on doing this. Um, I'll do this as long as I can get on an airplane. Um, I figure I'm going to live till about 120. <laughs> so I got a lot to do on the planet. Um, my wife's uh, company, um, have you read the E-Myth yet? The E-Myth? Dang it, I just did it, didn't I? There's another book. I, I, t I promised I wouldn't do a bunch of books tonight. Get the E-Myth. Who's read the E-Myth? Got to be a couple of you, right? Can we recommend that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, by the way, E stands for entrepreneur. It's the entrepreneur myth. And so this, this business that my wife is building right now, we're actually building it in line with Sarah's pies. And when you read the book, you'll know what I mean. Uh, one and then two. Hi, Stuart Sterling. Thank you for your time. Um, Two-part question. If I, when I have an idea for a solution to a problem, how do I figure out exactly 
um, what I need to launch it as far as capital? And then also, second part, how do I protect my idea? Those are good. <laughs> Give them a round of applause. Those. Um, Stuart, I'm going to address the, fir the second one first. Um, call someone at the V2TC or at an incubator here. My recommendation would be Mike Lewis up here in Santa Barbara. He, he, he will point you in a direction of that second one. Okay. Um, please. Contact the Scheinfeld Center for Entrepreneurship. And she's raising her hand right there. That's okay. Perfect. Um, the first one is, and, and I would say, is, by the way, is it a product or a service that you're launching? Service. service. So, phew, that was easy. Um, write more. As crazy as it sounds, the business that I'm running right now that I started in 2007 started with four letters to the editor I wrote to the Los Angeles Times. In nine weeks, they published four articles that I had written about the state of education in California and what I was teaching the kids versus what I believed the kids should be learning. Um, for the second half of this room, this won't mean as much as it will for this half of the room, but if you think about this one, students entering kindergarten this year are retiring in 2072. I can't imagine what's coming next year, let alone 2072. I mean, if we could go out and get a cup of coffee or a beer and you could tell me what the iPhone 6 will do, I'd give you a lot of money. <laughs> if you could tell me what the iPhone 6, because the iPhone 6 is around the corner, 2072. So that, to me, Stuart, is what I think of when I hear your questions. And because it's a service, it means you're going to have an educational component to that, what you're providing. Uh, let me give you a name, Joe Polish, like shoe polish, Joe Polish. He's probably the king of marketing, services, and ideas. And if you contact him, just say that I recommended you contact him. You betcha. Um, I think there was a hand in the middle, and we're going to make this the last formal question. And then I don't have to be anywhere. Uh, I'm going to Kansas Monday, so <laughs> we, can, we can hang. I actually have two questions. Is that okay? <laughs> Okay, the first one is, um, back to the domains for a second, um, how did you start with your domains? Like, was it where you got an idea and you thought, hey, some other guy might buy this, so let me buy it up right now and uh, sell it to no. the highest bidder? No. Okay. So can I d take that first one and then we get to the second one? You, yeah. Or do you want to ask me the second one and I have to remember it? No, 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 no. The first go ahead. One. Okay, I got you. I got you. Okay. Um, essentially, for me, it was, it, to buy a domain right now is about 10 bucks. So if I can go out and have an idea, and then I go home and I spend $10, and I can put something up that would be of service to people, that maybe they would download a book, download a PDF, download something. It, so it's not just a domain name you're buying. You're also working on the website itself. So it's not just a name. Exactly. Okay. And to, fa to piggyback on that, a lot of those domains are pointers. So I'll buy a domain over here. For example, I bought one called Productivity and Technology. <coughs> that domain, if someone were to type it in, Stuart points to a long blog post I wrote about productivity and technology with a link to buy an Amazon book. Does that make sense? So, and, and by the way, you probably, you know, I, I did not do this up front because I, I thought I could get around it. But when I think about entrepreneurship and small business, I'm thinking about small business. I believe that's what's going to get us out of this mess. Can I create something of value that when I provide that to people, my needs will be met? I'm going to get to your second question in a second. Um, a great mentor of mine, he said, Jason, on one side of a piece of paper, write down all the bills you have and all the expenses you have in a month. On the right-hand side of the paper, just write down businesses you could start to tick off the bills. <laughs> all right, the business we started to, to create, the, the, the business that we started to go to Italy, we imported merino wool sweaters from Milan, and we sold them on the UCSB campus. And Jody and I did that way back in, in when. And that was the start of the continuation. Number two. 
Okay, um, my second question is, so your, um, your easy, not simple ideas for entrepreneurship, finding a problem, making a solution. Um, I, I'm curious as to what you think about um, entrepreneurs who are thinking about not reinventing the wheel, but simply doing it better than everyone else. Do you have advice for that? What I heard in my head was that, that Ecclesiastes quote, there's nothing new under the sun. That's what I heard in my head when you asked me that question. Um, you know, the title of my book is Your Best Just Got Better. So if in 18 months I can be better then than I was today, by my own definition, and like we did earlier, your definition of the word entrepreneur may have been different than your colleague's different definition of entrepreneur. Your definition of what's better may be different than someone else's definition of what's better. So I, I don't really have an off-the-cuff answer for that one. Email me. Okay. Melissa, I think in, in, in for time's sake, I mean, I can keep on going, but they, they sign up to be here from 4.30 to 5.30. So do you want to come back down carefully? And right. Yeah. Watch those cords. Hey, can we do a round of applause for Melissa? Put this together.